Where do we fit in? <clears throat> As you know, uh, this year at the Davos World Economic Forum, everybody was a flutter over the question, is the United States in decline? as Britain was at the end of the 19th century. Um, what's your take on that? Well, I think that, uh, <clears throat> look, you, you, what I've been struck by, which again, traveling around the world, you know, we talk a great deal. Our conversation about the world is largely a conversation about ourselves. You know, we, we like to say, what, we go around the world and we I say to people, uh, enough about me, now tell me, what do you think of me? You know, I mean, that's, that's sort of, you know, we have two modes of operation. One is to talk about America and the other is to talk about what the world thinks of America. And our debate has all been about anti-Americanism. You know, one side saying, we've got to do something, this is a horrible problem, we've got to woo the world back. The other side saying, nah, you know, they hate us anyway, they're all French or vaguely French, so we can, we can ignore them. But while we're having this debate about anti-Americanism, the world has moved on. Uh, you go to, you know, uh, around the world and you discover they're much more interested in what's going on around the world. They're, the dynamism, the energy is in places like China and India. And, and again, as I say, it's sort of really everywhere. So I think part of what's happening here is just the centrality of the United States politically, economically, culturally uh, is, is shifting. We're still the most important country in the world. We're still the largest economy in the world. We still have enormous attributes, if you, you know. But we no longer have that hold on the world's attention, imagination uh, that we had once. And some of this is a result of trends that were long in existence, when I say long, 10, 15 years. Some of it is the Bush administration, which has accelerated these trends because of the loss of legitimacy. Uh, the loss of what Joe and I call soft power, this, you know, the, the attractiveness of the idea of the United States. Um, but one thing I hope we will come to as a country is recognize that this, this world is changing and we have to figure out how to fit into it, how to remain central to it, what we need to do. Uh, we, you know, we can't sit and mourn the loss of the hegemony forever. We can't bash the Bush administration forever. They've only got, what is it, 14 months left or whatever it is. At some point, we have to kind of move on and say to ourselves, how do we prosper in a post-American world? Let me ask you about that because you're coming from a slightly different place on the compass than a lot of people who are in anxiety over this issue. Are we in a sort of permanent decline like the British Empire before us? And if I read you correctly, you're saying, wait a minute, the basics are still very strong. We are voted the most productive nation in the world in the World Economic Forum, et cetera, et cetera. But you do have a, a, a caveat at the end, which if essentially there are certain very specific things we need to address to sustain that position. If we do, we're probably not in a long-term decline, we're just having to share it a bit more because others are rising. Yeah, absolutely, you know, I looked at... But what are the dysfunctions at the moment that you, you think we really need to address? First, let me, let me say a, a, sure. a second about the strengths, which you're right that I, I... When you really go under the surface, the, the froth, and you look at the United States, what you're struck by is first, is an amazingly adaptable uh, a flexible economy. Um, yeah, I know it's going through a difficult time now, but that's actually part of its strength is that it can take pain. It's a roller coaster. It can really ride the downturns as well as the upturns, and a lot of countries can't. You look at Japan, which got stuck in a recession for almost 14 years. We can let it happen, accept failure, you know, put people out of work that, that are in unproductive industries so that the economy can, in, in effect, adjust. The second part of it is we still have enormous strengths in industries of the future, nanotechnology, biotechnology, in the knowledge machine that produces those industries, higher education. We have the best higher educational system in the world. But, you know, there's no question. You look at all the rankings, we dominate universities and technical institutes, all that kind of thing. Um, and then the, we have the first draft pick of the world. You know, we take in all these hungry, smart people, and with all the everything else you may say, we still take in more people than the rest of the world put together. The United States takes in one million people a year legally. That is more than the rest of the world takes in put together. So we have, you know, demographics going for us, we have economics going for us, 
The thing that I think we really have a, a, a problem with is politics. We have our political system, to my mind, is brain dead. You know, we are just in a terrible rut with where we are. I mean, take one example, and, and, and if you th say to yourself, one of the most serious problems we face is what to do about energy. What to do about the way we use energy. We are, among, we are the most inefficient user of energy in the advanced industrial world. Um, in terms of our dependence on highly unstable regimes in, in, you know, if, in the Middle East, but in other places as well. In terms of our inability to figure out how to get from where we are now, which is using stuff that is clearly going to run out at some point to the next stage to renewables. And okay, you say, given this, we have the most important presidential election in a generation taking place. What is the conversation about? The conversation has been about a gas tax holiday, which most economists would argue is perhaps the single dumbest idea you can, you can have <laughs> in terms of how to deal with the current <clears throat> problem, right? Yeah. So why does this happen? I mean, I would argue this is a symptom of a larger problem, which is that the political system is completely broken. There is simply no incentive to inflict any kind of short-term pain for long-term gain. You know, you go to China, you talk to a mayor in a Chinese city, and I'm not um, um, uh, whitewashing China, but this, there's one element to it, and it's not just true of China, it's true of a lot of countries. You ask them what, what their city is going to look like, and they'll tell you, okay, in five years, this is where the population centers are going to be. In, in, in five years, I'm going to need energy from here. In 10 years, this is what it's going to look like. In 20 years, this is what it's going to look like. I have never had a conversation with an American mayor like that. I mean, the idea that you would talk about anything beyond the two-year electoral cycle is impossible. And the idea that you would inflict pain on your constituents in some way for what's going to happen 20 years from now, it would be considered comical. It would be considered kind of naive and political suicide to do things like that. So, I mean, you know, Obama is now making the point that the gas tax is a stunt. And you know the general opinion of the of the of the, the the kind of political pundits, not the economists, has been, how naive is this guy? He doesn't un understand how to talk to middle America. Well, I mean, if talking to mi middle America means you know pe peddling them these kind of uh, absurd nostrums, then there's something wrong with the system. And we've got to figure out how we get to a point where we can find a, a bipartisan way to actually solve problems. You know, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why these dysfunctions exist. But I do think that if you look at social security, you look at health care, you look at our propensity to overconsume and undersave, you look at the fact that we're borrowing as much money as we are from the, from the Chinese and Asian central banks every day, there is nobody talking about how do, we, how do we get ourselves into shape, you know? Instead, we've talked about whether or not Hillary Clinton landed in a corkscrew pattern in a Bosnian airfield 14 years ago whether Obama has close associations with William Ayers, who when he, was in eighth, when he was in fourth grade set off a few bombs, and whether or not John McCain uses his wife's plane, which by the way is completely legal under current campaign finance laws. So what are we talking about? <clears throat> <clears throat>